Hi there and welcome to this presentation on Albert Schoenberg's disease. My name is Alex Bushell and uh, let's dive right into it. So Albert Schoenberg's disease is named for radiologists. In 1904, Albert Schoenberg. It's quite rare and it's hereditary with familial bone abnormality. It's characterized by predominant sclerosis or defective skeletal bone remodeling, which we'll talk about soon, and a lack of reabsorption of the more primitive osteochondrous tissue. It inhibits formation of mature adult bone with medullary canal containing marrow tissue. And we have different inheritance patterns. So, what do I mean by inheritance patterns? Let's first understand what osteoporosis is. Okay, and it is the uh, colloquially known as marble bones. All right, and it's familiar disorders characterized by increased bone density or skeletal remodeling. So I want you to think of it as osteoporosis is the uh, big category and we have two subcategories of sclerosis and bone defective remodeling. We're going to be focusing today on the bone sclerosis which is an abnormal increase in density and hardening of bone and you'll see why in just a second. Before we get to that though we need to understand what do we mean by a familial pattern. Now the disease we're talking about today, Albuquerque's disease, is an autosomal dominant disease, and that's one on the left here. All right, and basically it means that one of the parents has a defective uh, mutation uh, in their genes, and both their sons and daughters have an equal opportunity uh, to pick up that mutation in the genes, uh, as opposed to the autosomal, autosomal recessive. Okay, so moving on. Here's osteoporosis as the big parent group, as I said, and we have three subclasses underneath it. I want you to pay attention to the right hand column and at the one at the top there, osteoporosis with delayed manifestations. Okay. Now, like I said, Albertson's disease is a sclerotic um, uh, condition, all right, and it's a mutation in the CLCN7 gene. Okay, and we'll get to that shortly. Uh, <clears throat> But what I want you to think of is um, within uh, everyday bones, there is skeletal remodeling all the time, and we have an equal opportunity from osteoblasts, which build bone, and osteoclasts, which uh, eat bone away, and so that uh, our bones can grow and develop. And in this instance, the CLCN7 mutation uh, inhibits the osteoclast deformation. So that's a little. Uh, summary, let's get to the particular common symptoms across all of these diseases. Uh, we have palsy of the face, malocclusion of the teeth, and trapped facial or auditory nerves, which sometimes lead to social decompression. And if you think about uh, thickening of bone, all right, we're talking about long bones, but also within the cranium, uh, the foramina uh, where those uh, cranial nerves pass through uh, to do their jobs they start to uh, become more occluded and the space starts to uh, enclose onto those cranial nerves which can uh, damage them all right so a typical patient like i said it's a gene mutation of clc and 7 gene out of all of the um Osteoporosis diseases, it is the most common, all right, and that's our prevalence rate there, 5.5 in 100,000. Our patient is young, all right, and onset is uh, child adolescence or young adulthood. And the reason why it's uh, not picked up any earlier than that, compared to some of the other malignant diseases uh, within the osteoporosis group, uh, is that uh, Patients will generally present for unexplained reasons, such as uh, unexplained bruises um, or pathological fractures. Uh, so with our unexplained bruises, they can be from cytopenias, uh, anything from anemia to panocytopenia, which uh, uh, if you think about the thickening of sclerosis of the bone, uh, the more than the medullary space in the lung bones uh, fills in <clears throat> because of the uh, genetic mutation in the CLNC uh, gene, um, the red blood cell formation uh, starts to decline 
uh, within the bone space. Uh, and therefore we have extramedullary hemopoiesis, so formation of red blood cells outside of the bone uh, and in the uh, blood vessels. Because of that, it uh, overloads the spleen and the liver, and we get an enlargement, hence the hepatosplenomegaly. Um, just to uh, talk a bit more about the uh, CLCN7 gene, um, it basically directs uh, something called the CIC7 channels. And their job is to regulate the pH within um, the osteoclast cell. Uh, and they do that by, uh, for every uh, two chloride uh, ions which come out, uh, they regulate one, uh, sorry, uh, for every two negative chloride ions coming out of the cell, they'll put a positive chloride uh, ion in. And in doing so, they regulate the pH and the acidity of the cell so that the osteoclast can dissolve the bone tissue the way it should. All right, and because uh, that is disrupted, we have a thickening or sclerosis of the bone. Now, um, Within the cranial nerve uh, examination, which we'll see shortly, uh, cranial nerves uh, seven uh, are affected through the internal acoustic meatus, uh, and that will present as a palsy within the face. And the cranial nerve uh, eight will be present as a hearing difficulty or loss from bone thickening and occlusion at the same uh, internal acoustic meatus, which can result in sensory neuro deafness. All of our other cranial nerves are unaffected. All right, so we're going to start off with uh, asking our patient if there's been any sense a change in smell or taste. So, have you had any sense of smell changes at all? No. No? And can you taste uh, everything normally? Yes. Yeah, any changes to sweet, sour, or salty? No. No? Everything's clear? Yes. Lovely. All right, so we're doing optic nerve, cranial nerve number two. All right, we're gonna start off with uh, some pupil reactions. All right, so, can I get you to use your left hand to cover your left eye for me? Cool. Now I'm just going to come in, I'm just going to shine a light and looking for contraction of your pupil. Lovely. Now I can get you to drop the hand for me and just keep looking at me. Now I'm looking at this eye here as I put the light into the same eye and I'm looking for accommodative reflex, which is fine. Can you put that hand over that eye? Lovely. Looking for constriction of pupil. Right, now drop that hand for me and I'm looking at this eye now. And that is all in all. Great. Now, what are you going to do now for me? I'm going to test some uh, visual acuity with the Snellen chart. I need to hold it for me. Can you read the top two lines for me? E L T. Lovely. Can I get you to read this line here for me? D H J B S. Lovely. Can you read this one backwards from right to left? J H D F C. Lovely, and just the last one again from right to left, the last line down there. H P F T L. Lovely. And what colour is that? Red. And what colour is that? Green. Lovely. Thank you very much. Alright, so we're doing uh, ocular motor nerve, trochlear nerve, and abducens nerve 3, 4, and 6. Alright, what we're going to do is a couple of uh, eye tests. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test convergence. Okay. Can you just keep your eyes on the pen? All right, follow and keep your eyes on the pen. Let me know if you get any double vision. I'm just looking for equal movement of the eyes and it all seems fine there. All right, from there, we're just going to test some pursuit movements. All right, just keep your eyes on the line. Now again, I'm just looking for equal movement, see if any eyes are lagging. Just keep following it for me. Lovely. Don't move your head, just look at the pen. Good. Looking for any nystagmus or any of this as well. And that looks.
That's fine. Okay, can I get you to use your right hand to cover your right eye for me? Good, lovely. And what I get you to do for me, okay, I'm going to move my finger. All right, I want you to tell me when you can see it move. Okay, looking at me, can you see it move? Yeah. Lovely, change hands. Good, same to me. Looking at me. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Awesome. And this is for the last one, you're going to test uh, your reflex. You're going to keep your eyes on me. Alright, so we're doing trigeminal and nervous cranial nerve number 5 and facial nervous cranial nerve number 7. In an Albert Chauvin's disease patient, we expect to see a deficiency in the facial nerve uh, and the facial palsy. So we're going to be looking at the symmetry of the face first, looking at the um, folds within the forehead and the labial folds around the mouth. In a unilateral lower motor neuron leash with uh, an occlusion at the internal acoustic meatus from the thickening of the bone, um, I would expect to see uh, on the left side the wrinkles would be quite tight and the right side would be smooth and the labial fold on the left would be uh, visible and the right side would be smooth with a droop in the mouth. Now we're going to ask uh, the patient to do some uh, movements of the face. Can I actually try and scrunch your eyes shut for me? Lovely. And can I get you to show, show me your teeth? Great. And can you try and whistle for me, please? Okay, a bit of difficulty there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Can you try and look up towards the ceiling for me? Alright. Lovely. And we might expect to see um, as the patient looks up, the eye will try and close as well. Uh, from there, we're going to look at the trigeminal nerve and we're going to uh, feel for um, symmetry of the temporalis and mass of the muscles and also for equal contracture. Did you try and clench your teeth for me? Great. And that's an awesome relax there. I'm going to do a jaw joke reflex now. All right, just relax your jaw for me. You can put my thumb in the mentalis and give it a tap. And we're just going to check the uh, sensory input to the V1, V2, and V3 divisions of the trigeminal nerve. Um, I'm just going to ask you to tell me if it, you can feel sharp or soft, okay? Can you close your eyes for me? All right, which one's this one? Sharp, sharp, soft, soft, sharp, sharp, soft, 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 sharp, sharp. Great, and now what we call there, can open your eyes there for me? All right, and that is the trigeminal facial nerve. All right, so here we're doing the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. All right, and we're going to be doing the Weber's and Rins test, all right, using a 256 megahertz tuning fork. All right, so um, I'm going to place this on your head in just a second, and I just want you to tell me um, if you can hear it in one side more than another at all, okay, okay. or if it's equal, okay? Yes. Is one side more than the other? Yeah, I can hear it in my left more than my right. Okay. I can't really hear it in my right at all. You can't hear it in the right? Not really, no. Okay, alright. So that was the Rebus test. Alright, we're going to look at the left ear, which is the good ear first. Okay, we're going to place it on a muscle process. Just let everybody can't hear it anymore. You can't hear it anymore. Okay, can you still hear it? Yes. Just let me know when you can't hear it. How is it bad now? Okay, great. So that is where um, air conduction is greater than bone conduction, which is a good result. Uh, we're going to look at the right side now, and we're going to do the same test. I'm just going to come behind here. Can you hear that at all? Not really, no. Not really? Okay. Can you hear that at all? No. No, okay. Alright, so uh, that is... Uh, probably an indication of sensory neural deafness, right, due to the um, bone thickening on the internal acoustic meatus of the elbow shumbix uh, disease patient. And um, that was where um, air conduction was less than bone conduction. 
All right, so this is the second part of the Cranial Nerve 8, the vestibular clocular nerve uh, testing. Uh, we're going to be doing the Dix Hall Pike maneuver um, just to look at the uh, what the cochlear is doing as far as vertigo is concerned, and we're going to be looking for the stagnus. Uh, can I get you to uh, speed a sitting position with your legs facing that way for me? Right, and just shuffle back a smidge. Yeah, that's, that's probably right there. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to take hold of your head. I want you to keep looking in my eyes. Okay, just let me know if you get any dizziness or vertigo. Okay, alright, three, two, one. Okay, I'm just looking into her eyes, I'm holding her in this position. Alright, and there's no nystagmus. How are you feeling? Yeah. Okay, three, two, one, up we come. Alright, now, can I get you to turn around and face your legs that way? And we're just going to try and do the same thing on this side. I need you to shuffle back quite a fair bit. Good, lovely. Actually, you might need to go forward just a smidge more forward. Good, okay. And looking up into my eyes. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, I'm not seeing any stagnus there. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm fine. No vertigo? No. No, Bruce, not me. No. Lovely, three, two, one, up we come. Alright, and that is this whole pipe maneuver all clear. All right, so we're here and we're doing cranial nerves uh, 9, 10, and 12, uh, the glossopharyngeal, the vagus, and the hypoglossal. Uh, so, in, with this examination here, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, can you try and swallow for me? Great. Do you have any difficulty doing that at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And I'm just going to look at the um, hyal bone there as you do it again, so just swallow for me. I'm just going to any deviation from one or the other. Um, because there's no difficulty swallowing, I wouldn't do a gag reflex, so that's not needed. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to examine the tongue and the mouth, and we're going to be looking for um, any deviation from one side to the other or any fissiculations of the tongue. Right, so, can you get your open mouth for me and point your tongue out? Ah. Good. And looks like it's on the midline and there was no fissiculations there. Okay? So... That is a test for cranial nerves 9, 10, and 12. All right, so we're here, and we're looking at cranial nerve number 11, uh, which controls the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid the mastoid muscles. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be examining uh, the sternocleidomastoids the mastoids on either side for any hypertrophy or wasting, and also the trapezius uh, for the same thing, so hypertrophy or wasting. Uh, to test the trapezius, uh, I'm going to ask the patient to shrug their shoulders for me and hold. So you're going to push down equally. Lovely, and that held nicely. And then to test the sternocleidomastoids, of mastoids, can I get you to lie on your back for me with your head that way, please? <clears throat> All right, now, uh, we're going to be looking at the sternocleidomastoids of mastoids just here. Can okay, you lift your head off the table for me? Good, and just hold against my pressure. Uh, and I'm looking at the equal contraction of both sides. And relax down there for me. And she's going to test each side equally. She's going to rotate. Push up into this hand here. Lovely. And relax. And push up for me. And relax. Okay. And that was the equal contraction on both sides. And that is the cranial nerve 11 examination. Now, further um, investigations and systems checks will need to, to be... Uh, performed other than a neurological screen, uh, but we can just talk about them here and leave them for another time. Uh, due to the um, uh, spleen and liver uh, under such a load for the medullary space uh, in closing, uh, we need to check our vitals as well, so heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and respiratory rate as well. Now, Albertomous disease is not truly diagnosed until uh, an x-ray is performed. And like I said, uh, our typical patient will present through unexplained bruising in the cytopenia is there uh, and or pathological fractures. Uh, and on an x-ray, you'll see a thickening of the vertebral end plates um, or a um, thickening of the bone itself. And uh, in the spine, it presents as a rugged jersey. Um, image okay uh, and we'll also need to perform a complete blood clout uh, just to check the red white blood cells and the platelets uh, and how the thickening of the medullary space is affecting 
with values. And here on the left, you can see uh, in the right hand image the rugged jersey uh, presentation with the thickening of the end plates. And the right hand image is uh, that is the thickening of the cranium. Uh, and if you can imagine where our uh, internal acoustic meatus sits, um, then you'll see the occlusion, you can imagine the occlusion there to the facial nerve and to the vestibular cochlear nerve. Treatments, um, unfortunately, there's not many. Um, you can have hemo, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or HSCT for short. Um, the CLNC N7 gene, all right, can lead to neuro uh, degradation, and uh, it, the cost um, benefit needs to be weighed up as far as would you try and use the HSCT therapy uh, because of the uh, increased levels for rejection, infections, high levels of calcium. Surgical decompressions can be made to the cranial nerves uh, for 7 and 8 as mentioned before. Uh, if uh, the pathway of HSCT is not undertaken. Some corticosteroids can be uh, taken, uh, but at this point there isn't enough evidence to support its routine use. However, conservatively, uh, dietary uh, intake of vitamin D and calcium supplements is quite important to help with the uh, sclerotic uh, bone. And there are references, and thank you very much for watching this presentation.